why is it now the, the focus on multimodality and why should I as a PhD student look into this approach? Well, uh, to answer that, I would, uh, the first question I would ask you, what's your PhD about? Yeah? Social media. Um, Internet. <laughs> Um, and if you said to me, my PhD is about the social media and the internet, I'd say, um, Barrett, can we have a look at um, an instance of what um, you're actually wanting to look at? Well, actually, the, the BBC website might do, just for, for, as an example. And I would say, um, so uh, you're interested in social media and, and how that works, um, and you have a, a training in sociolinguistics, uh, but you're not really interested in images. Uh, Why should I be interested <laughs> in images? Because if you look at this website here, there is quite a bit of writing, but it may also be that the writing actually gives you merely a partial account of what is going on. It's like having sentences which aren't completed. It's like somebody who speaks to you constantly um, in, ha in half-finished sentences, and, you, and you, you'd wish to, you'd really like that person to finish a sentence, but the sentence is never finished. Or maybe they start in the middle somewhere, you don't know what the beginning was. Um, each of these modes here does something, it does one thing. And if you're interested in how social media work, um, then you, you, you really need uh, to have access to all those things which are significant for the person, for instance, who made a video that she or he wants to put on YouTube. Um, and in the YouTube video, quite often what you have is very little spoken or written, but a video of somebody acting or a dog walking across the green meadow or something or other. And if you say, well, I'm only interested in writing, what you've really done is you've made it impossible for yourself to ask, to really answer the question which is being asked by your PhD. So if I wanted to look, for example, how social media is used to communicate. If I'm yeah. only looking at written or spoken yeah. language, I'm missing out on part of the communication. Uh, you might miss out on a little bit, you might miss out on all of it. Mm. <laughs> and it would change from, from moment to moment because there are videos which are merely actional, a video of some, something moving. Mm. Um, there are videos where there's a lot of speech um, or an interaction. I mean, we might appear on YouTube. <laughs> And um, so it depends on what the video is about, um, what this particular thing is about. That will then tell you what you should, what should be in the foreground of your investigation. But aware that there's always other things, um, which maybe be, be are marginal but should not be ignored. So if I want to look at both the image and the text here, mm -hmm. do I need to learn two different toolkits to describe this? Doesn't I mean it's a lot of work to get into these two different kind of almost fields of how to describe something. I think that's true. Um, or maybe at the moment we start with the toolkits which we've inherited. Um, we have a discipline called linguistics. We have disciplines uh, that have dealt with images um, in different ways, um, art history, but other, um, other disciplines too. We have disciplines that have dealt with gesture, but always within a narrow frame. Um, and in that narrow frame, those things which co-occurred, which came together with gesture or with image or with writing, uh, were ignored. So in linguistics, famously, there's a lot of stuff that is paralinguistic or extralinguistic. And a linguist always says with irritation, of course I'm aware of these things, but they're kind of extralinguistic, you know, well, don't, don't bother me with it. But it may be that uh, the thing that uh, we're not bothering the linguist with has a direct effect um, on how um, what is being said or what is uh, being written um, has been said or is being written because it actually exists together with this other kind of stuff. Um, so um, if you want to make for yourself the meanings available which are actually there, it behoves you at the moment to use the tools which are available. Now, I think what will happen over the next decades um, in this field of multimodality is that tools will, which, will be, which will, will be developed which um, allow us to talk about all modes at some level in the same way. So I might st start by saying, well, look, um, in writing, in sort of extensive writing, there are paragraphs. What's a paragraph do? Well, a paragraph has a particular kind of function. It brings together certain kinds of elements in a written text which seem to belong together more than other elements in the written text, and that's useful. And we could say, 
are there similar kinds of things that happen in relation to, I don't know, clothing or furniture um, or images? Are there, are there things which are similar to um, that kind of bringing things which are related together? Um, and we might find terminology for that. But then we wouldn't want to give up the notion of the paragraph and the fact that the paragraph is made up of sentences and the sentences are made of, of smaller elements. Um, so uh, we would have a toolkit which will serve for all the modes that we need to be interested in and need to be able to account for. But we'd, we'd also then ask somebody, can you hand me the toolkit for writing? Or can you hand me the toolkit for gesture? Because I want to look at gesture and writing together today. So if we have this big toolkit, yeah. um, I'm, I'm a bit worried that we might lose some of the detail that we might have if we have the linguistic. I think that is a, that is a, a very, very important point, um, that we should not lose things which are essential, which have been produced by the disciplines which we've had. Um, so linguistics has given us lots and lots of insight into how language works and sociolinguistics, um, how language is used, and it would be completely stupid to throw all that um, overboard and say, well, sail kind of unencumbered into the future without any tools. Um, but it may be the case, and I think it will be the case, that these tools will get changed um, in relation to new purposes. Um, and I think that's probably the history of all disciplines, um, as long as we can kind of um, uh, you know, look back over their history. If I'm interested in identity or mm -hmm. learning, how, mm -hmm. how could I use a multimodality as an approach? In Europe, let's say, uh, or in Western Europe, um, there has been a, a tradition which is at least 200 years old, which has um, said identity and language are absolutely connected. Um, if you take my language, um, you take my identity. Um, and that's had uh, quite severe repercussions and still has. Um, in Yugoslavia, once it broke up, um, you know, this became a matter of life and death. Uh, and in other places in Europe, it's a matter of life and death. But actually, when I think about myself, um, I grew up um, learning German, then I learned English. Um, so I can still speak a bit of German, I can still speak a bit of English. Um, my identity is actually f formed not only through my ability to speak German or to speak English, but it al it's also formed by what kind of music did I hear when I grew up in Germany? What kind of... Um, architecture did I encounter in the streets where I walked? What kinds of um, food did I like and, and get to like um, as a child? In, in, in other words, identity reduced to um, speech or writing alone is again a kind of a, a, a very restricted notion of identity. We are more than what we speak or hear or write or read. We are probably 90% more than uh, writing and reading and so if we don't have means of uh, encountering or having means of coping with taste or aesthetic dimensions, how do I arrange my office or my home or yeah, identity rests in very many more things and so we would be reduced to a narrow notion of identity and also a kind of a defensive notion of identity. You take my language, you take my identity, yeah? you kill me basically. Well no actually. Um, even if I didn't speak any German, the food that my mother cooked is still very vivid in my memory, mm. um, if you see what I mean. And of course, it relates to learning because in the formation of identity is the process of an ongoing um, process of learning. And when I moved to Australia, um, I learned to, to like new foods. <laughs> I learned to um, encounter different um, ways of people interacting, uh, all sorts of things constant learning. Um, but if I then kind of uh, took a more serious notion of learning, say learning in school, um, I might also then want a much, much more expanded notion of learning from one which uh, simply focuses on narrow things like um, numerical notation um, or writing and reading, um, the linguistic, um, or maybe even drawing. I would want to say this child here comes from that particular background and she or he is bringing those kinds of resources into the classroom which she will express in particular ways. And I ought to be open to that. I should be able to recognize that something is happening here which I hadn't seen before. And not say something's going wrong, but rather something is happening here which I need to understand. I think a multimodal lens gives you the possibility of seeing more. 
Um, and if I'm interested genuinely and seriously in learning, in school or out of school, then I think a, a reduction um, in the possibility of seeing um, becomes a real impediment. So how does that apply to this website? Well, we could have a little practical bit of research. We could look at websites of um, French television or German television stations um, or television stations in China um, or in the Middle East uh, or anywhere else and we could say, oh, they look a bit different. They look similar. Um, probably all of them are now modular, mm. um, whether Chinese or, or um, um, say, as in this case, English. Um, but there's also a difference. And the difference actually points to the fact that um, these things are also socially formed. Um, the people, this in a sense reflects a notion of an English identity in terms of its color scheme. I would predict hypothetically that if I looked at a, a Berlusconi television station, the color scheme might be somewhat different. Yeah? And the choices of things um, might be somewhat different. The arrangements might be somewhat different. Yeah? So identity isn't just um, me in isolation, but identity is what I, who I am and have become in a social environment. And this, of course, is a social environment. I make things for the social environment. That social env environment gives me things to engage with. It's a kind of a, a, re a reciprocal uh, trade between it and me. I provide stuff, it provides stuff. Um, I can't see myself um, as, as a person, as an identity, in isolation from the world in which I live, whether the world of the new media or the world in a much wider sense.